We are all very excited to have Paolo with us today. So welcome all uh, to our colloquium, press start at Kedars Game Center in Shankar College, TLV. Uh, this is a series of talk dealing with the ability of games to promote uh, social innovation. So I'm Renaud Klusman, uh, game designer and senior lecturer in the master in game design at Shankar. With me is uh, Vered Pnoeli, which is the head of the Master Game Design Program, and Asi Borak, SVP at uh, Tilting Point, Chairman uh, at Games for Change, and a lecturer in the same program. So I would just say a few things about Paolo uh, for all of us who are not familiar with your work. So Paolo is a game developer, artist, and educator. He's a professor in Carnegie Mellon University where he teaches experimental game design, creative coding, and animation. His work really in the field of digital art, whatever you take it, digital art, media activism, game industry, as well as inter internet folk art, obtained ex extensive media coverage and critical acclaim. Paolo's artistic practice deals with the relationship between electronic ent entertainment and ideology. So Paolo advocates for independent and socially conscious game making. So be in attention, all of you. And Paolo, it's really a great pleasure to have you here with us today. All right, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I, I got a few slides that we can also like negotiate. Uh, like uh, I don't, yeah, I don't think uh, it's great to have like just pure frontal lectures on Zoom because uh, then it kind of like becomes just like, um, you know, like a video and you can probably find uh, plenty of videos uh, of people babbling. But I'm just gonna go give you just like a, a, broad, a broad overview of what my work is uh, without assuming that you already are familiar with it. Uh, so like most of, most of my work is released under the project name Molindustria, which means uh, soft factory or soft industry in Italian. Uh, I'm from Italy. I moved to the United States for, uh, you know, graduate school. Um, and it's a personal project, uh, even though I sometimes collaborate. And it's mostly really a bunch of games. Uh, um, a bunch of, like, you know, artists, uh, I'm in an art school and artists love to say, my work is at the intersection of this and that. Uh, and more industry in that sense will be at the intersection of ide ideology and uh, uh, electronic entertainment. So uh, since 2003, I made uh, something like 40 maybe games and projects and small projects. And most of them, you can sort of like see them here in roughly chron chronological order, uh, starting in a flash and moving to all sorts of formats. And they range from uh, agiprop vignettes about labor, gender, politics, environmentalism, uh, some satirical management games like the McDonald's video games or uh, oligarchy, uh, abstract playable theories, uh, uh, this one is an existential game about alienation, uh, a game about um, a day in the life of a drone pilot, and uh, also like more experimental stuff, like uh, things that can be, um, this is the drone stuff. Uh, I think, oops, well, uh, more like experimental stuff, like uh, games that can be played during protests uh, or uh, um, this, this one about gentrification. Uh, um, and uh, this was like a virtual reality, um, sort of like experience about the relationship between gays and uh, uh, violence. So a lot of looking at things. This was not, uh, is a sort of like a anthropocenic, uh, anthropocene uh, um, CD uh, builder of using this sort of like abstract machine, machine created, uh, uh, generated uh, images. Uh, this is a smell uh, based game uh, made in collaboration with one of my colleagues. Uh, uh, this is a, a translation of a three uh, player soccer uh, that was originally. Uh, devised by the Situationist. Uh, uh, this is a more recent one, uh, the Democratic Socialism Simulator, which I can talk about a little bit later. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of like a, a very like a quick, uh, uh, quick overview. Uh, so um, in uh, sometimes, uh, I, I hear some uh, um, 
some background. Can I ask uh, uh, the maybe Vered? Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to put you in a spotlight, but I'm uh, sort of like hearing myself. Okay, I think it's good now. Yeah, so I sometimes presented this as a choose your own lecture. That's why I was uh, uh, asking for poll, polls, but we can also let the, you know, let the moderators, uh, 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 you know, decide what they want me to talk about. I got like, uh, like really like three, three potential approaches uh, since we don't have time and we want to leave time to uh, Q&A. Uh, one is about simulations and complexity, sort of like playing systems, and uh, one is a, a bit more about storytelling uh, and uh, empowered the issue of power fantasy. And uh, uh, the one like like it's about my sort of like curation, um, uh, sort of like curatorial work uh, that my or my relate to, you know, your program. Uh, and that can involve a visit to an online visit to uh, to my digital space, digital gallery, uh, that is a multiplayer uh, online space. Uh, I, got, I also have like a project that is currently on Hiatus that is about friends, so sort of like machine uh, learning generated uh, uh, friends episodes uh, that I, I, I will take off of the list. It's just there on the thing, like let's not talk about friends. It's also like the least uh, socially engaged uh, thing ever. Um, all right, so yeah, well, Tell me, folks, what do you want to do? Ty type in the chat. I know you're all like game people, so you feel free to just like, uh, you know, shit talk yeah. on the side chat. Uh, like, let's let's make it lively. Yeah, choose, choose your path, yeah. Not in hippo, though. How many more? <laughs> Let's make the picture more complex. <laughs> All right, maybe we, we go. Oh. Okay, that's that's a, that's a good one to maybe to yeah. start. Let me see. Christmas that's, that's Right. Let's. All right. So awkward role play. So. Um, games have this relationship with powers that I try to complicate in various ways. And uh, uh, one is to sort of like provide experiences of disempowerment uh, and uh, um, putting players uh, in a, a rather awkward or unpleasant roles. And uh, with the idea to precisely point to this power relationship in our societies, you know, like, um, you know, games uh, often put you in a position of, you know, being a leader, a general, uh, you know, a superhero, uh, and even like a gangster that is in a position of power. And I kind of like like to subvert that or chain or, you know, play around with that. So, uh, like, one of my first games uh, was, uh, was called... Uh, um, uh, orgasm simulator you might have seen it very briefly and it was uh, uh, putting you in the shoes in, in, or in the lack of thereof in the shoes of a uh, of a woman attempting to fake an orgasm to play uh, to to please uh, uh, his uh, her her uh, partner so that was like the second game I made uh, and uh, um, and uh, what uh, yeah, like the, the, the idea was like to, to sort of like ironically put you put you in that in that perspective. So um, this one is another one, perhaps a little bit more serious. I hope that the sound is not too loud. If so, if so, you're gonna if so you're gonna uh, suffer it because uh, I have no way to make it. Yeah, I'm gonna try to talk over it. But yeah. Uh, this is a game that sort of like deals with labor and alienation, uh, in which you are uh, sort of like a classic, uh, faceless, uh, white collar trapped in uh, his daily routine. And you wake up, you put your suit on. And you're always kind of late for work. I'm just gonna let, let it play for a second.
so by, by this point, the player pretty much only has uh, pressed the right button to advance. Um, there's not much to do, there are some objects to interact. And then finally, you get to the office. You reach your cubicle. And uh, it fades out and it, it just like starts over again. And, uh, and it apparently poses no challenges, no... Um, I'm gonna just like mute this. Um, uh, it poses no challenges, uh, uh, you know, at a first sight. Uh, uh, you can be essentially stuck in this loop forever. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of players do get stuck in this loop forever. And they're like, oh, this is so profound. It's just like, you know, routine or whatever. But actually, like, there is a little bit more to that. Like, intentionally or not, the player uh, end up, ends up discovering some subtle deviation from the norm. Uh, for example, like you can uh, um, uh, stop your car in the middle of the highway by, you know, pressing the space bar and uh, you can sort of get off the car and uh, uh, go for a walk and pet a cow. And uh, there are other like, uh, or you can, uh, uh, instead of going right, uh, as, uh, you know, the typical game convention, you can sort of like go left uh, and uh, encounter, you know, a homeless person that takes you to a cemetery and things like that. So it's uh, like, there are like uh, six or seven hidden uh, sort of like uh, secrets. Uh, you can stop uh, there, take your time to, you know, um, to catch a falling leaf, uh, you know, things that are kind of intentionally cheesy in a way, but um, but yeah, or you can show up uh, and uh, uh, without pants uh, to uh, at your office and get fired. And then the game reaches a resolution when the player discovers all the possible ways to subvert his okay. everyday life. And uh, lucky, luckily, I don't really have this kind of cubicle job anymore. Uh, at that point, I was just like coming out of one of them. Um, and um, what I do today is kind of like my dream job. Uh, I live in Pittsburgh. I teach at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, it's a, kind of like a dream job. Uh, the school is great, uh, but it also doesn't exist quite in a vacuum. Uh, Carnegie Mellon is an important technology research center, maybe perhaps like uh, your school, the school you're in. And uh, um, we do mostly, I mean, we do many things, obviously, uh, but we do cybersecurity, we do robots, and we do all sort of ro robots. We do some, some of them are cute. Uh, let me see if I can. Yeah, it's like this one was, uh, oh boy, loud. Uh, this one was, was made at CMU. Uh, dancing robot. We make, make creepy robots like this one here that sort of like climbs uh, up a tree and, uh, um, you know, spies, spies you and you can even just like stop by and they'll give you a demonstration and they'll, they'll make the snake robot crawl over you. Um, and even, you know, robots that straight up kill people. Uh, this one is called the Crusher and it's basically a self-driving uh, little uh, armored tank, a little tank with uh, you know, a gun on the top. And uh, uh, it's also because of this context that I started to become interested in uh, robotic warfare and automation because um, it's not like that I'm really like that surrounded by that because again, I teach in the art school, but still you sort of like sense it around you, uh, you read about it, you know? And uh, uh, more importantly, uh, military, and entertainment technologies have been evolving together since the beginning. Uh, you're probably familiar with Space War, which was the first uh, digital uh, video game uh, in the you know in the common terms, and uh, it was created at the MIT during the Cold War. And so the MIT was basically entirely founded by the Department of the Defense, and uh, it, it was even like. He, he, not not only like a bastard child of the military industrial complex, but it was also uh, created on the top using hardware, military hardware, like the screen, uh, the, the monitor was uh, round because it was uh, uh, a retrofitted uh, World War II uh, radar. So it even had that kind of like relationship. And uh, Obviously, games have been regularly used by the military for uh, recruitment and PR and training, uh, and even to deal with post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a segment from uh, um, a video, a video installation by Hiram Faruqi. 
uh, that is sort of like analyzing, uh, um, just opposing uh, uh, different ways that games are are you know employed in war in the you know uh, American war war specifically. Uh, and the, the current revolution of drone warfare is also often associated with the idea of gaming, because uh, if you think about it, drone wars are kind of completely mediated by screen like games and they are operating through controllers that are very similar to game interfaces. And sometimes they are even designed to look like game interfaces because they know that people are already familiar with those. And uh, I would say like even on a moral level, the promise of drone warfare is sort of to allow you to um, fight a war without suffering the consequences. So it's like kind of like very game-like to me in the sense that you are sort of like uh, uh, removing the risk uh, uh, from a particular action, which is like kind of like the staple of all games. So because of all of this, essentially, I decided to make a game to investigate the war in, uh, um, in the 21st century. The game is called Amand. And uh, it's a narrative game about a day in the life of a drone pilot that lives in uh, you know Nevada. Uh, United States and it, it sort of like the game imagines this daily routine of one of these new kinds of soldiers uh, and uh, it employs this two channel setup and two channel gameplay that I sort of like I've taken from uh, some video art uh, practices that I kind of like. Uh, the way it works is, is the, the sort of like the split screen uh, it's a single player game, uh, but it's split screen uh, to sort of like highlight the theme of this connection that runs through the whole game. Uh, was trying to imagine the strange, this sort of like strange dissociation that a pilot that you know that is both controlling a new unmanned air, air vehicle in Pakistan and then sort of like going home to the to his family in a suburban house. And uh, the story is kind of linear actually, but it's moving around a different kind of space. So there's no way to really radically change uh, the events in the sense of like, oh, you have a character sort of like going left and right and it's sort of like represented by this scene, which is the co uh, commute uh, in the middle of the desert, uh, which is, you know, the street between uh, um, Las Vegas and the Nellis Air Force Base where this, this, uh, this character works. And uh, but you, so you're not really moving in space too much, but you are wander, wandering in the subconscious of the character, and so you are participating to the development of this character, sort of deciding if this person is, uh, you know, like a, a jingoistic, uh, patriotic guy, or if it's like has like doubts about the job he's doing. Uh, so you're like both. Uh, if you want, you can humanize us, or you can play, uh, you know, different roles within. Uh, uh, within this uh, sort of like uh, very nar narrowly structured uh, uh, day, uh, including uh, you know having conversations with your uh, co-pilot, which is actually your uh, your pilot, and um, you can even hit on her, uh, but you can also like have like a more profound conversation and uh, and things like that. Then you you go home and you are facing your uh, son that is playing video games and. Uh, um, asks you about um, about you know like the traditional war you know is playing a kind of like a war, um, Call of Duty set in World War II and so kind of like the relationship between uh, new new wars and old wars and throughout this you are always uh, negotiating your attention between uh, usually two uh, conflicting actions in this case sort of like controlling the the, the drone and uh, uh, choosing your own adventure choosing a certain uh, um sentence words uh, or thoughts so you always have like these two things going on at the same time so this is a man again this is like 2012 when it came out uh there was almost like no interview about uh no documentary no interview about drone pilots so it was kind of like a long time ago and it was really like on the moment or on uh, uh like relevant for the kind of conversation that people were starting to have about drones um, so I also made like a bunch of simulation games uh, that are sort of like highlighting the problems that are inherent to each industrial process uh, that you, uh, you've seen uh, very briefly. And I also realized that I wasn't immune either. Uh, we tend to consider communication design and gaming uh, uh, in the digital realm as a sort of like completely immaterial sector, but beneath uh, the clean informational surface of techno the technologies that we use, there is a very material reality. So there's another game uh, called Phone Story. Um, this is this was like maybe 2011 or something like that. Um, I can sort of like play a clip, uh, hopefully. Give you a sense. This was a game oh, for phones. For Thank you for iPhones. joining us. 
let me tell you the story of this phone while I provide you with quality entertainment. Once upon a time, there were minerals resting in the bowels of the earth. One of these minerals, called coltan, is found in most electronic devices. The majority of coltan's world supply is located in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a country torn by a brutal civil war. The increasing demand of coltan produced a wave of violence and massacres in the Congo. Military groups enslaved prisoners of war, often children, to So you get a sense, and the, and the game itself is a kind of like a whack-a-mole, and then uh, you move on uh, uh, to, to China, and that was a moment in which uh, uh, there was uh, a wave of suicides among uh, 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 workers who work at Foxconn or in those factories where all the phones are assembled. And so the game, the, the other mini game is uh, is about sort of like catching those uh, uh, factory workers before they hit the ground, which was, uh, it seems like excessively dark humor, but it was actually not that different from what was actually happening because the Foxconn responded to that first wave of suicide, not by improving, you know, working conditions, but rather by uh, installing safety nets to, you know, cap discourage people from jumping or to for, to, to catch them. Uh, and then you move to the West, uh, to a kind of like a generic uh, West in front of an Apple store, you're distributing uh, phones, and then you move to the uh, to the end of the life cycle. And so you're somewhere in Pakistan or East Asia, and you are sort of like, uh, quote, unquote, recycling uh, this electronic components uh, in a uh, in a scene that is sort of like recalling that sort of like evoking the very unsafe, uh, you know, unhealthy conditions, uh, uh, really like substandard condition in which uh, uh, this devices are, uh, uh, you know, recycle or uh, re repurpose. And there's also this, this voiceover sort of like it's outlining the context of these scenes. So you're essentially kind of like playing the game uh, uh, almost instinctively because it's uh, they are all like very simple games that were sort of like mirroring the kind of uh, early iPhone games, uh, sort of like a touch screen games. And, uh, and as you're doing that, you're sort of like the voiceover is outlining what exactly it means uh, to, you know, to do the action that you're doing. And uh, yeah, it's sort of like the idea, like the, the voice, the, the idea is that the voice comes from the device itself and addresses you as a consumer. And by the very act of, you know, holding this game and holding this device, you're in a sense complicit to this chain of uh, uh, sort of like externalities to use an euphemism, but kind of like bad things that are happening in the production process. So that's kind of like uh, my, my section about um, Awkward role play. There are a few more examples that I could uh, I could talk about it, but um, I don't have the slides here. I guess uh, we can we can leave it for the uh, for the questions. Um, so going back to the to the main main room, uh, what would you write? Uh, would you like me to talk about? Would you like us? Would you like us maybe to ask questions about this section or, or wait for the end? Up to you, I have all day. Oh, you do? Okay, that's good. Um, uh, does anybody have any question about this? So just, just write your name in the chat. Okay. You can also vote for the next uh, <laughs> segment yeah. if you don't. So I just have one question then. Um, you know, we are very used to um, films and music, uh, you know, all the media uh, being uh, quite political. Uh, do you think video games can be um, extremely, I mean, can, do you think we can see more and more video games being having a, a political agenda? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, like uh, in this- Not, not just all... experimental ones. I mean, like- Mainstream. Well, yeah, triple yeah, A. Yeah, I mean, to me, there are uh, a few uh, almost like structural problems with that. Uh, one, one is the fact that, you know, if you have like a big budget, uh, um, it's hard to really address issues that can be divisive, you know, that can, you know, potentially alienate a portion of your um, potential audience. 
So that is like the reason why, game, you know, AAA games uh, are tend to be conservative, not only ideologic, but ideologically, but also in terms of structure. You cannot put like, you know, a, you know, fifty million dollars to develop a game that maybe, you know, has like an, ex, you know, experimental gameplay or some uh, touches upon some issues that are. Uh, you know, uh, still controversial. So that is obviously one problem. Although I think there have been a few, uh, I think there are some issues that are definitely like, you know, political and serious and worth discussing that are not perhaps uh, as, uh, they're not like as risky in terms of like getting people upset and thinking about, you know, like uh, 1979, uh, the revolution, Black Friday, right? About the Iranian revolution. So that is, I think is detached enough uh, from, uh, a lot of you know western concerns uh, and it's very subtle as a game but that is like a game that is uh, has a, like a triple a production value uh it's made by a former rockstar uh developer or like a, the, the director was um and so like that's to me a, a pretty good example and probably I'm, I'm assuming it made money <laughs> you know like it, it was like a viable commercially viable product so i'm i'm sure that we will see more of that uh I think another problem is also the, um, I, I guess like in, from my perspective, there are like a couple of other problems that one is the time that it takes to make a game uh, can be a bit of a liability. Uh, meaning that if I, uh, I can potentially see, you know, like a, a bigger indie game about the, you know, the uh, one day in the life of a drone pilot, but uh, by the time uh, it sort of like gets developed, uh, like, you know, like if you have like a development cycle of like a couple of years, uh, you risk to be kind of like behind the curve in terms of the kind of conversation that you can uh, address. Same thing for uh, uh, the phone game. Uh, that was kind of to me important to talk about it while there was literally this, you know, wave of suicides. And um, yeah, some of the issues might have become uh, kind of like common knowledge by then now because there have been so much, you know, cultural, you know, activism in a way about that. Yeah. yeah. I, I think another issue uh, that is what I'm sort of like a, gonna sort of try to address in the next, uh, uh, my next project that I'm not gonna talk about is, is more like an issue of um, uh, envisioning uh, sort of like alternatives. So I think uh, uh, right now in uh, the United States at the very least, uh, but in most of the West, uh, it is not taboo to criticize, you know, capitalism, sexism, because there is, you know, like a pretty decent uh, stronghold uh, in the center of cultural power, uh, you know, from, you know, liberals essentially. So it's like, you can even, you know, like watch a movie for children, a Pixar movie, uh, you know, the Lego exactly. movie is kind of like, uh, it's, quote unquote, anti-capitalist, if you're seeing it from the eyes of, you know, somebody that grew up in the 90s or something uh, that is, you know, somewhat, somewhat lefty. But uh, if you like, really carefully like s analyze what it's saying, it's really not re really articulating any alternative is saying, oh, yeah, there is greed, there is, you know, environmental destruction and things like that, there is war is bad, pollution is bad or whatever. So those are like themes that you see often in, uh, uh, and I'm expecting to see in games as well, uh, even, uh, you know, very prominent games, but you will never see like, uh, oh, well, and therefore we need, uh, you know, stronger unions or uh, therefore we need to, uh, you know, uh, seize the means of production or something. So that's not something that I'm not seeing anytime soon. Yes. The okay. Of Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Yaron has a question, right? Yaron, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. So expectation of reaction to the games versus actual reaction received. Yeah, that's a good one because uh, uh, it is. Uh, almost on a case by case basis. Uh, for example, the ones I've shown, uh, I just shown like three, three of them, but um, the reaction from uh, the everyday, the same dream, the sort of black and white one was an interesting one because I thought it was like a comedy game and I thought it was like a parody, a fa funny parody of a, an art house game with, you know, like some uh, uh, maybe clever for the time, clever ideas perhaps. Uh, 
but uh, people were like took it extremely seriously and they were like oh yeah that is uh, uh, that is extremely you know profound and uh, made me cry and things like that which was like uh, oh that's interesting and I think it's mostly because of the soundtrack I guess the soundtrack is a bit somber a bit uh, serious and dramatic but to me it's kind of funny to me it was meant to be a funny game anyway uh, the phone story one, uh, the, there was like a, an interesting reaction, uh, mostly because it was uh, banned from the App Store uh, the, day, the day of the launch, right? So you're a game developer, so you probably know that if you want to submit something to the App Store, uh, it goes through a verification pro uh, process. So it goes through an, an approval process. Uh, like e every single app has to be looked for, you know, potentially bu bugs, uh, you know, make sure that there's no like porn stuff or whatever. And uh, phone story was approved on the first pass. It was able to be on the app store. But as soon as it, uh, as soon as it launched, people started to be like, oh, look, there is like a, an anti-Apple uh, game on the Apple store. Uh, you should play it before they, they censor it. And uh, sure enough, after a couple of hours when it was really being uh, sort of like being picked up by social media, and uh, being talked about, uh, they just pulled it, uh, which was a fairly rare move. It doesn't it doesn't happen that often that a game is approved and then just like uh, uh, pulled out of the store. So the the reaction there was uh, like this was meant to be a game about you know the production process process of electronics, and. Uh, because of that uh, move, because of that market censorship, uh, it became uh, uh, a project about essentially like corporate censorship and uh, uh, the cultural status of games. So can, uh, uh, and uh, you know, platform politics, like, so like can uh, a platform that has essentially a mon monopoly of distribution over uh, the most popular, you know, device, uh, is it can they even do that or like you know legally or morally because they will never do that for books right and that's part of their guidelines uh, at that point uh, the apple guidelines were essentially saying if you want to make something political uh write a book you know <laughs> if you want to talk about sex uh, write like a sex ed education app or something just like don't make an app we don't want that kind of stuff uh, as uh, in the form of apps so they were like seeing apps as more of a uh, you know, like a, a microphone, a, a screwdriver, uh, like a, a container full of sugar, like something that is uh, really doesn't is, doesn't have any ideological sort of like uh, implication. So that became the conversation, and it was kind of like a bit annoying for me because that wasn't really the point of the game, even that even though that conversation was kind of important. Okay. So, shall we move to uh, another category? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, another poll? Yeah. I think the votes goes for the like, like, huh? Yeah. Right, let's see. Yeah. We, have seen it, we have seen it before. Huh? There was quite, yeah, this, a, quite a few. There were quite a few. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. So, uh, like, like. So, so, you're seeing everything. Um, so, um, Life Like is this sort of like project that I started a couple of years ago. It's kind of interesting to talk about it right now, but hey. Uh, so here in Pittsburgh, I run this venue called uh, Life Like uh, with my partner and a few friends, uh, which is basically my garage. It looks like that. Uh, it's, it's a building, it's a rather small building, and uh, it's a space for independent games and playable Paolo, art. Yes. Which area of, of the city? This is Garfield. Okay one block uh, uh, off pan yeah garfield bloomfield yeah uh so yeah like physically speaking is this small room of, of about like 20 by 20 feet which is seven by seven meters uh, it kind of looks like that and uh, conceptually is something between an arcade and an artist run gallery so there are a couple of venues like this in the united states and in the world uh, most notably i think uh, uh, baby castles in new york uh, uh, there is also like a, a game art gallery in uh, Chicago. Uh, there are uh, there is an, a more like arcadey, alternative arcadey situation uh, at Wonderville in New York. Uh, but they're mostly in like very big global city in which you have like a critical mass. Pittsburgh is actually a, a rather small town. 
Uh, so it's a very strictly non-commercial endeavor. Uh, it doesn't have opening hours, so like a normal gallery, it's just like a, a, there are only one night shows that last four hours, uh, about you know one evening, and uh, they are happening. Uh, they were happening every first Friday of the month. So this is this was a show about um, alternative ball games. So uh, you don't. Uh, this was a. a um, um, solo show uh, by, you know, with all works of, uh, by Nat Natalie Lawhead. Uh, this was, was uh, our first one, which was like sort of like Valentine's Day themed and they were all games about relationship and love and uh, sex. So, uh, and uh, uh, it opened in February 2018 and so far we've been putting together 25 shows like one every month and they are all showcasing uh, pretty much six games uh, centered around a theme this was was about public transportation uh, there is even one uh, uh, game that you can see there the one that is sort of like physical on the wall uh, that was made uh, for uh, um, for the exhibition uh, this one was uh, about Iranian games made by Iranian and Iranian di diaspora people. You can see the cat and the coo, uh, things that uh, Aziz is probably familiar with. Um, this was uh, was uh, just like a scene from a, a one about non dystopian futures. Uh, so that one included a kind of like a custom interface uh, that uh, and it was uh, situated in the backyard uh, that has like a, kind of like a more conducive atmosphere for. Um, kind of like a relaxed, uh, chill, chill, artsy game. Uh, so sort of like trying to um, shape the environment and uh, avoiding. Uh, so the, the, the original idea was to uh, have something in between a gallery, uh, you know, like a gallery or museum space that are usually, you know, like kind of like empty white spaces. And you're always trying to sort of like try to fit the game in that sort of like very modernist, minimalist, uh, clean situation that is not very conducive for like, you know, fun and play. And on the other hand, uh, the other big places for, you know, exhibiting games are the more like commercial fair like uh you know you know gdc it is uh, the uh, electronic consumer show or uh conventions essentially they're more like consumer oriented they are like loud crowded and they have like a, a very like commercial sort of like uh, uh environment so here the idea is to curate that curate a series of games and uh, uh try to create uh, within you know the limits uh, of my limits of a side project of a side project uh sort of like create an, a, 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 the environment that is the most con conducive for that kind of play uh this one here um it had like you know this like inflatable uh sort of like couches that are sort of like shaped like uh, reproductive organs uh, and it was all a show about uh, bodies uh, and uh, the atmosphere was uh, very like you know soft and suffused uh this was was uh, probably the better uh gives you a better idea of what the uh vibe is because it's a video this was was devoted uh to analog controllers uh, um so this one uh it involves sort of like fighting with a strap on uh, Atari joysticks. Uh, this one is a local game uh, that runs on, a, on an oscilloscope and uh, on an analog synthesizer. This one is a diff somewhat famous line wobbler, uh, one dimensional dungeon crawler. It is really like architectural and really uh, kind of like steals the show every time. Uh, this is the one that I was showing that I made for this show, uh, along with uh, Heather Kelly, my colleague from the ETC, um, it's uh, yeah, it's kind of like a smell smell based uh, uh, game in which you're a, sort of like a cop uh, a cop dog. Uh, this one is an entirely analog game that runs on a VHS, sort of like a do uh, cock fighting for rock paper scissor. This was another CMU related project uh, that runs on a, a embroidery machine. Uh, it's kind of like a um, Settlers of Catan uh, territorial control uh, game that runs on an embroidery machine. And so uh, the venue itself is a uh, uh, very small windowless, windowless. It's a dark cube. It's kind of like a, and it's always like a cramped space uh, with people touching controllers and sharing food and drinks. Uh, every, um, every month at every exhibition, there are like some special 
uh, sensorial experiences uh, curated by by uh, Heather, uh, which are uh, um, uh, usually like special food that is on theme. And so obviously like uh, this sort of like this whole situation uh, had to be suspended because it's kind of like the perfect environment for the spread of uh, you know, a virus like COVID-19. And so we had to suspend all real life event due to that. And, uh, but the thing is by being again people, you know, we are quite comfortable with online stuff uh, due to, you know, streaming culture, uh, online gaming that we've been there online and we are kind of comfortable in that, in that situation actually. And so uh, I took it as a challenge to experiment with, with formats. And so uh, I launched a multi-user virtual space uh, with a museum attached to it. And I call it the smallest MMORPG. Uh, and the idea was to still have some online exhibition, but also recreating uh, a bit of the social situation around the games themselves, because uh, uh, as you probably know, if you've ever been to, you know, um, an, an art opening, uh, people don't really show up for the art. Uh, like the art is just like a bit of an excuse to hang out together, you know, to flirt, to get wasted. And that was definitely the case for Like Like and the gallery crawl that it was uh, around uh, those events. So um, this thing uh, uh, runs on browsers, so we can, uh, all sort of like move there. So you can, uh, if you want to see more uh, like like stuff, uh, you can uh, 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 you can sort of like, oh yeah, there is this uh, pretty amazing uh, uh, responsive. Can you still see my screen, right? Okay, yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah, there is like uh, this one was a um, audio vi visual audio immersive uh, uh, ping pong. So um, this was made in collaboration with a uh, musician and multimedia artist, uh, Jesse Style, who is also a frequent collaborator of mine. You can sort of see that basically you're playing ping pong normally and there are like uh, uh, pretty intense uh, lights uh, sort of like messing with your experience. So um, one thing we can do now is uh, we can go to, I'm posting it here. We can go and visit the space. So I'm just gonna call myself uh, Paolo. Uh, we can visit the space all together and I can give you a tour, but you can also ask me questions about anything you want. So you can pick your, your you know, color scheme and your body. I'll be, I'll be the kind of regular guy with a yellow, yellow shirt. Yeah. So this is how it looks. Uh, I'm gonna just wait for you <laughs> to join, but you can, uh, you know, type things. All right. So somebody blah blah showed up. Yeah. So you can click and uh, you can enter the main exhibition room. So uh, there are a few iterations of this. Uh, who is uh, doing the annotation? I'm going to, I'm going to revoke your rights to annotate. <laughs> there, disable all the annotation. Um, but yeah, you can, uh, you can sort of like run around uh, like, aren't there like 44 people here? I guess you're all spending some time. No, no, they are here. Though. Oh yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, let's try, let's try to crash it. So, cause it's really like, especially the, I guess, quote unquote museum part is it really needs a, a bunch of people to be properly enjoyed. So this is the main exhibition space and it's like a, a faithful reproduction of the space as it is, as you've seen in the picture, there is a backyard, there is my dog that is, uh, I can't even, call him uh, so this is uh, like literally what you would see except in uh, you know 128 pixels or so and uh, there are like games that are played on a projector obviously being a, an online exhibition i wanted to have uh, um i wanted to have games that can be played with just one click uh, uh, so browser based games uh, and uh, for the first uh, the first exhibition was uh, centered around bitsy games uh, uh, so it was a collection of six or something uh, games made in Bitsy, which is a really nice platform for the creation of 
uh, kind of like narrative spaces. Uh, the second exhibition, which is the one that you see here, in the second exhibition in the space is um, uh, Are All Games Made in Particle 8, which is a kind of like a virtual console, um, a virtual console uh, in the sense that you have this sort of limitation of say like an old Nintendo or Game Boy uh, and uh, those in terms of like palette number of pixels you can use and uh, and yeah you're sort of like accepting them as a creative limitation and it's a bit of like a fast prototyping but also a bit like assembly like so there is like a very interesting uh, um, demo scenes uh, I should mute this uh, there's an interesting demo scene, an interesting uh, 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 sort of like arcade, uh, like neo arcade scene of people who are developing specifically for uh, Pico 8. So check it out. In this exhibition, actually, I had like things that are uh, a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more like art house, I guess. They're not like exactly arcadey, like this one, uh, famous one, Enuigi, which is a kind of like a spoof of. Uh, you know, Super Mario in which you're like this existentialist uh, uh, Luigi figure sort of like reflecting of a fallen uh, mushroom kingdom and smoking cigarettes. So things like that, uh, you can uh, you, you can check them out. They are all like pretty much available online. Um, but yeah, the response to the to this was actually pretty strong. I wasn't really expecting it. Like the local response among, uh, among uh, Pittsburgh people that usually show up uh, at the real events uh, was actually lukewarm because <laughs> I guess Pittsburghers don't care too much about that. Uh, but internationally, obviously that kind of like extended the scope uh, of the curatorial project, I guess, to everybody in the world. Uh, so you don't, didn't have to be in Pittsburgh to do that, to be, you know, to check this hang out, quote unquote. And so it was actually like quite successful. It was also, you know, the uh, early months of the pandemic and uh, people were sort of like uh, still trying to figure out what happens exactly to live events, to, you know, galleries and museums in the space. So this was like released very, very quickly. And uh, uh, it almost provided a sketch of what you could potentially do in this online spaces, even though it was totally a throwback to a, kind of like a 90s, uh, 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 sort of like a 90s visual chat, you know, like, I don't know if you're, probably most of you are not old enough to remember visual chats, but it was kind of like that. Uh, so yeah, it was, uh, it was successful to a point that uh, I decided to create a, a whole uh, wing, a more like a modern art wing of the space that has uh, uh, essentially experiences that are, um, that are designed specifically for this like little platform and within this constraint. So yeah, if you follow me around, uh, uh, we can, uh, uh, by the way, if you're still in the main exhibition room, you can go to the right and there is a door that takes you to the, to the art wing. So for example, this room here to the right on the first floor, uh, it's sort of like uh, playing with the fact that people uh, really enjoy like this guy who was, uh, I don't know who this guy is, but was sort of like following and kind of like messing with me because there's not a lot that you can do here. So uh, yeah, the idea is to make uh, the whole like uh, playing with avatars uh, a little bit more entertaining. You can also talk and uh, it produces a, pa a palindrome. Yeah, if you right click, you can uh, dance and each uh, avatar has uh, its own move. Uh, let's move to the to the one on the right. Or actually, we can move to the one uh, uh, to the first floor in the center. There is a wall text, but there's also an installation that is uh, a bit um, sort of like a, a statement of what happens uh, in the, most of the space. Uh, uh, the installation uh, on the right uh, uh, might look different to different users. So this is something that uh, online world. Uh, uh, try to avoid at all costs. The idea of a shared uh, uh, multiplayer persistent world is that you all see the same thing at the same time. And if that is off sync, that is an engineering problem to be solved. Uh, but uh, a lot of like 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 uh, on Omoma uh, experiences rooms sort of play with that. For example, like some of you might see the, that installation in a different way. Uh, in, uh, on the left, uh, there is the consonant room. Uh, you, we can all just uh, 
stop by there. Um, yeah, try to say things. Yeah, so um, what is happening, things actually works pretty well. What is happening there is a, um, <clears throat> a kind of like a limitation. Uh, it translates uh, all, uh, all of the vowels uh, into uh, one. So if you say panini, it will show up as pinini. Um, if you say lol, it will show up as lil. And uh, every minute is sort of cycles, uh, um, cycles the consonants. So right now the guard just says uh, no stools, no books, work protocol. Uh, and that's uh, a sign that is uh, tur turn into, uh, uh, into uh, O's. Yeah, so it's a bit like a, this is an old uh, letterist, uh, pataphysics, uh, poetry sort of constraint. How like, can you, what can you say without, you know, a vowel? And, uh, so let's go to the, to the second floor there. Um, so there is one that I, I will have to mute my site. If you want to go to the, uh, well, there is like a fake, a, a fake user here, there is like a bot. Uh, that is like a paranoid bot and most people don't even notice that especially if there are like many people so one of them is uh, one of us is uh, uh, automated as an npc so if you go to the rhyme room um it's going to be a bit loud but uh, the idea is that the first thing that one person says becomes the blue the the rhyme that other people have to rhyme so it's like a rhyme battle and you can only say this uh, one, uh, one word once so uh, and uh, ideally you have a little bit of time altogether. We have a little bit of time to sort of like slam or jam. Uh, if the music stops, then uh, there should be time for uh, uh, like, there, there will be another sort of um, round. Yeah, you cannot say the same thing after that. Are you all just like typing dots? Ooh. Yes. So I have a notch. That's kind of like what you're supposed to do. Uh, if you want to win, uh, you, you should make one sentence that actually rhymes. Yeah, I want. Yeah, so yeah, there's like a, this is an actual game if you want to play it, and some people can be actually quite competitive. Obviously, it depends a lot on what kind of words gets uttered first. So if you go uh, up to the left, and feel free to stop me or like ask me, um, you know, questions that are not related to this. I just so this one, the censorship room. Uh, it's actually a bit of a remake of an old game that I made. Uh, um, the idea is that every word can be said only once. So uh, if you know, try to say Paolo or let's say elephant. Um, yeah, if you try to say elephant again, uh, it will not be allowed. It's not since, since the beginning of the time, every time that I guess the server restarts uh, the, this thing. Uh, gets yes it's the canceling word room uh but yeah you can also like sort of like play as a as a bit of a game you can sort of like uh, uh push uh, and it gets a little bit more interesting when uh, people have been uh, using it and talking in it for a while all right let's go let's go upstairs so on the third floor um, yeah, there's the main room that there are sheep. Yeah, and um, right now we are sort of like, you're sort of maybe seeing my, um, 
my screen as well. So you're sort of like figuring out what's going on. Basically, every every player appears to the other as a, as a sheep, and they can only say "bah." But you're seeing obviously yourself as a normal person, uh, and uh, you're. But it might take a while to realize that. Uh, the family room is actually one of the most popular rooms. It's on the right. Um, I don't know if we have really time to play th th this, uh, but some people can get quite serious about it. So this is a, a role-playing room. Uh, when I released the first uh, iteration of the museum that was just the exhibition space, uh, uh, somebody, I, I presented it as the smallest MMORPG and somebody on the internet was like, well, this is not an MMORPG, there's no RPG. And I was like, well, fair enough. There is no role playing in just hanging out in a space, in a visual chat. And so I kind of like created this room specifically for role play in a way that you don't really see that much around, maybe a little bit in Roblox, where there are like specific role play experiences. And so you are assigned a role and, you know, kind of like stereotypical suburban drama and you're supposed to, uh, yeah, do, do what you guys are doing, <laughs> you people are doing. Um, there are some like uh, little hints uh, here and there. There are a few things you can, you, you can do. Um, you can sort of like troll your role and uh, uh, you can also get out and get in and you might be reassigned to different roles. And uh, when uh, the system runs out of roles, uh, you're just uh, an, an ant or, or uh, some kind of like a flea ju jumping around, which is also kind of funny. Because you're sort of like you're the audience, uh, but you also have a little bit of a presence. I think you can say zzz or something. Anyway, so the uh, let's go to the dark room. To the I mean, you can have fun in the family room uh, playing. Uh, there is a dark room for cyber sex because uh, uh, it is a bit of a '90s throwback uh, when people would just. Uh, uh, you know, like text, sext each other on a video chat, on a, a sort of like text chat. And so here again, like you are expected to say things. Uh, and uh, the, the system sort of like uh, turns your sentences, uh, uh, removes, uh, um, well, you can try it, but it kind of like removes one word and uh, um, replaces it with, uh, with something naughty that is usually censored in uh, online chat. Yeah, that is, uh, yeah, perfect. I think one of the funniest moments uh, during the opening is somebody started to uh, uh, to recite uh, uh, the ha Hamlet monologue, uh, like from the beginning to the end, uh, uh, and it was pretty pretty funny. And I kind of like always like even if I made it, like if I try to to speak, it kind of always surprises me how these inversions are kind of like kind of entertaining. Um, sometimes uh, you might end up uttering something normal, you know, un unadulterated. Uh, so the very last room that we can check is the VIP room, uh, which is very simple. It only has three visitors. So it, only three visitors are allowed uh, to the VIP room. And uh, if you're like the fourth, uh, you will get in, but you will bump out the first one that entered. So this is a bit of like an homage to a project, an old uh, net art project called uh, Bump List that is still existing, which was a ma mailing list that was uh, kind of working on that sort of situation. And uh, you can sort of like, it might be the richest part of the uh, visually <laughs> of the place because you're sort of like, you can interact with some objects, you can drink champagne and sort of like look th things around and uh, just uh, generally uh, revel in the fact that you are a, a very important person until you get kicked out. Anyway, um, yeah. So that was that was it. So I recommend to. I mean, you you folks are uh, all vaccinated, right? So you don't need. Uh, you're you're done with screens, but it's a good place to take dates. You know, dates online. It was a cyber sex room that you've missed. What is it? I, I saw a cyber sex room that you have missed. 
Oh yeah, yeah, the dark room. Yeah, yeah, you can. I, I, I was yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I missed it. Okay. You missed the train. <laughs> I, I was actually oh. playing. Yeah, yeah, listen. Okay. All right. Let me know. Yeah. Let me know if you have, if you have any question. We can uh, uh, switch that or whatever you want. Otherwise, I just can keep rambling. Uh, there's another hangout space. This one, uh, maybe if we all log in, it might crash. This is much less reliable. Um, this is a, a 3D representation of the space. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, let me show you. Uh, this was kind of like a, a sequel. And you're like uh, um, some kind of like salamander in an empty space and you're entering a, a very, um, very accurate uh, depiction reproduction of the space uh, so if you get a sense of what it is or how miserably small it is you can uh, you can check it out um the link is this one here again there are some visual glitches that i still have to figure out because of the webgl stuff but yeah and this is a show that uh, it was all about first person uh, uh, games uh, first person experiences so I thought it was uh, would have been funny to make it um, into uh, you know three dimensional first person situation. So the, the link is in the chat if you want to log in, and you can talk and uh, say like it's kind of like a bit of like a trippy. Oh, wow. It's a bit of like a trippy experience. Uh, oops. Yeah. I guess nobody's showing up. <laughs> what if you throw a party and you're the only person showing up? All right. I guess they. The, the father will be outside. Your, your students, your students logged out, or maybe, or maybe my thing broke. <laughs> I think we are still in the two D version. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that's a little bit more more interesting. But this this one, I, I'm kind of like proud of it because I sort of like a made it from scratch really um and uh it works pretty well <laughs> until it crashes due to too much traffic i guess anyway so yeah moderators uh, uh feel free to stop me or uh, tell me what to do next oh here's somebody oh here's somebody so, th so yeah, i think we can definitely that... open it for questions right yeah, Since, yeah. Uh... Uh, someone just asked matan just asked uh where do you get all these ideas which we i what is your inspiration what do you get your, what? uh pff, inspiration was uh, i'm dancing uh for for what uh, well yeah i guess you got you have to narrow it down because uh um the inspirations are coming from you know different different things it's uh, basically it's basically watching the world is getting upset about things and then making games. <laughs> kind of yeah it's when, more when or less do you like get that. enough upset to make a game out of it that's, that's well i think the uh, yeah the being upset is only one of the components i guess one of the ingredients <laughs> being upset uh the other other would be uh well it's this idea actually does it make sense to 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 do in a game uh, does it have uh, you know nuances uh, that I don't know. It's like I never made like you know a game about Donald Trump. Like uh, even if it's quite upsetting as a thing, but it's just I don't feel like it was uh, <clears throat> a subject. Uh, I mean, directly the person or you know the phenomenon. I, I didn't think it was like a subject really worth unpacking uh, uh, through a game. Yeah. One thing that I'm quite proud about this environment is that you can uh, have uh, eye contact with other people to you know to talk about the theme of um you know a first person so like i can see this person here yaron and i can sort of like i can look uh, you know uh <laughs> i can look uh you know his feet or like their their feet or their butt and they can sort of like see where i'm looking at which is something that you don't really see that much in uh, online multiplayer experiences anyway uh you can also um lick the frogs and get and get high <laughs> how, how many 
people uh, do you usually work with? I know that you work in, with a collective of people. Can you just tell a little bit? No, it's usually just me. Um, it's mostly just me. And uh, if there are collaborators, uh, they are always, uh, you know, credited as something else. Uh, like Amend was made in collaboration with uh, Jim Rowe, who is, uh, uh, you know, writer and novelist and uh, many things uh, from Toronto, whom, you know, helped me with just the writing and it's also helped me with, uh, helping me with the next project. Um, uh, the, yeah, the Smell Base one was a collaboration with Heather Kelly. Um, you know, the... she gave a workshop actually here in Shankar a few years ago. Ah, then, yeah, right. Like I was mentioning because of... Yeah, she came to Israel to Tel Aviv to print screen and she gave a workshop here on a smell workshop. Yeah, right. Makes sense, right? Because yeah. I, know, I know she has a connection. So, um, so yeah. So Paolo, mm -hmm. Paolo, in terms of this uh, one, man, uh, one man studio in most of your projects, do you, do you encounter places where it's just something that you have a, a barrier or you'll always figure it out, learn it? I mean in terms of uh, especially the programming side of things? No, the programming side usually is all right. Um, I don't know. I, I think I'm a, at a point in time that to me, it takes more like the attitude. It's more like an attitude thing. It's more like I can do it, whatever. Uh, I'm going to wing it. I'm going to learn it. Um, uh, I'm definitely like, um, like, uh, I may uh, I, I did encounter a barrier uh, in terms of the art uh, and workflow. So I wanted to make uh, a game that was more like a narrative, you know, visual intensive game. And I just realized that I couldn't be that interested in making, uh, you know, animation 2D animations uh, and um, uh, you know, like a lot of like 2D assets. So I yeah. sort of like realized that I could have done that, but I, it wouldn't. It will not have been. Uh, at the level that justified that particular kind of game or the sort of like the production value that that is expected for a you know a post point and click storytelling game like uh, Kentucky Route Zero or A Night in the Woods something like that yeah. so like I cannot do that I'm not that good visually and uh, I didn't want to do that and so I decided to sort of like reshape or rethink uh, uh, the project in, uh, uh, in different terms. Um, Verit, can I ask another question? Sure. So well, this is something you, that... Yes, we don't have much time, right? It's like eight. Yeah, yeah I mean, Paolo, do you, you feel that we extended the... I mean, we exhausted the welcome uh, spirit? Is it too too late? No, no, that's fine. It's just... Some, yeah, you, 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 are, you, you have a time limit, I think, uh, <laughs> that I, I don't have. I'm, I'm good. I'm free today. Verit, what, what about you? Oh, it's fine with me. Yeah, sure. Okay, so look, one, one uh, quick question, uh, something that I really wanted to ask you for a long time. It reminded me a bit when you spoke about phone story, you know, the idea that you play a game on the phone that is basically saying everything that is wrong about the phone. So let's talk about Carnegie Mellon. I mean, you're coming with strong, I mean, I know you for, for a long time, le ultra leftist, let's say, especially in the US terms. Uh, even communist, in, in some would say, and you work in a in university. Look, it's not the worst in the world, but it is a very mm -hmm. mainstream, army connected, corporation connected. Uh, you know, the heart of capitalism, right? The U.S., especially in recent years, is uh, is in a very uh, very different place. So, how is it to to create in in that context? You know, and and. Mm -hmm. And that your work is is connected to all those yeah, yeah. structures. Yeah, I mean, in in part, I sort of like mention it how how it it is there, but but not really. Uh, I think um, I in I never like meant to move to the United States when I I kind of like got you know, got in the United States almost by accident, uh, uh, which is ridiculous because there are like you know millions of people that are trying, <laughs> desperately yeah, yeah. trying to, to immigrate. Yeah. So like, I'm a very like uh, high, uh, you know, like lucky, uh, low effort uh, Im immigrant, you know? Um, it's, so it's it just uh, happened similar, to me. Similar in my case, anyway, go ahead. Right, so, yeah, so I'm like, I have the, this luxury of being like, oh sure, whatever. And uh, originally to me, like the idea of like studying in the United States was in part to be, to be there, to be sort of like close to, 
to the problems uh, in, in the belly of the beast. And, uh, you know, for, um, I guess, like, uh, be, being a communist, uh, I'm also like an internationalist. So I don't really see the world so much in terms of like a national identities or, you know, like national limits, uh, you know, uh, to me, um, Sure, the United States is terrible, uh, but um, not it's not worse than uh, Israel and Italy and uh, many and you know the UK or whatever. So that, in in that sense, uh, also like that kind of like applies and extends to to the school. So uh, I'm in the, in the art school, which uh, if your experience at ETC probably was like pretty disconnected from uh, from uh, the art department, but uh, that is in area that of like autonomy, like the good thing about uh, Carnegie Mellon is that uh, it, each department is uh, extremely independent. And uh, as long as, you know, we have the proper enrollment, as long as we don't, uh, you know, fuck it up too much, uh, uh, they leave us alone. Uh, and uh, they are also, I think uh, they are also okay with having, uh, um, you know, kind of like the class clown sort of like, um, the uh, you know like the the jesters are sort of like uh, criticizing maybe even like the things that are uh, uh, at the very core of the uh, CMU you know uh, business model. Yeah. In terms of military involvement, the, the truth is that there is not a lot of it um, that is visible, mostly because they I think they figure out that the best way is to create separate unit. I don't know how it works in that in your university. I understand it's a kind of like a technical uh, school most most of it. You mean it should come. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. actually more a design school, actually. Oh more a design school. More okay, design, yeah. yes. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the, the way I think they resolve uh, the inherent conflict of having, uh, you know, military research is by creating uh, separate units that are like physically separated off campus and they are like self-founded and they are just uh, connected to the university at the highest level of research, meaning that there is a little bit of exchange, but not too much. Because uh, frankly, like uh, a lot of our students are, uh, you know, like we got maybe like a 20, 20, 30% of students that are from East Asia, they are international students. They will not be allowed to uh, participate in military research. Like they are like literally, you know, studying at the university that is developing the technologies to, you know, kill them, you know, potentially <laughs> to, you know, to uh, wage war. So, so the, the, uh, it's very well separated and uh, it's easy to even forget that this thing is happening and this thing is uh, interconnected. And uh, there is um, an element of, you know, social control into that and to be like, uh, oh, we have, uh, you know, uh, award-winning, uh, uh, Tony award-winning uh, uh, actors here that are uh, kind of like the front, the face uh, of CMU, but then in, kind of like in the back, they got the, you know, they got the military stuff. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, I remember a lot of in the robotics, like the stuff you showed, there was a bit of a connection. Yeah. But yeah, but uh, it, so one thing that they just, uh, like there's also like a change, like you were, um, you were uh, probably a CMU when uh, um, uh, probably at the height of the Bush administration, <laughs> right? So uh, in a way, these institutions are following the money and the money kind of like changes quite, uh, quite quickly. I mean, you're yeah. also familiar through, you know, the trajectory of Games for Change and how, you know, public money sort of like shifts continuously and then uh, you, you can, uh, you know, be in a position to be like, oh, actually, we don't really need that much uh, military money. And military money itself uh, um, can uh, be, can have like a pretty dramatic uh, uh, emphasis, meaning that maybe in the early 2000s, it was all about robotics, uh, you know, like machine that kill. Then they sort of like figure out that the drones don't really work that well. They are like a very they are kind of like being used by, you know, the terrorists to recruit, yeah. to, see, to say yeah. like, oh, look at this, uh, you know, Americans that don't have, don't even have the balls to, you know, to kill us in person. Yeah. Um, and so like that, that was like a shift during the Obama era. And I, I feel like the shift also went through uh, things like, for example, now the more like recent uh, uh, research is about manufacturing. 
So it's relatively easy without the uh, United States uh, framework of military being everything and military power being uh, not that different from industrial power. Mm -hmm. So from like the perspective of the kind of like a dominant uh, imperialist nation, it makes sense. Like you can sort of like... uh, jujitsu it and be like okay let's uh, use military funds to uh research uh, manufacturing yeah, high-tech manufacturing yeah. process processes yeah. and i think it's fine i think uh, i mean it's not fine it's like uh, in the short term it might be a uh, you know real politic proper strategy to be like oh actually energy de- in the independence uh, is is a good idea and, and therefore yeah. we use uh, some uh, defense uh, uh, funds to well, you see it, you see it in with the vaccine production and distribution right you know same thing and the, it was done with the internet in in the beginning of the right yeah No, so there is maybe but, maybe a question a question for his time yeah and, and then we can yeah probably finish because there's another class actually yeah okay I'll, I'll thank you uh, okay uh, thank you for the talk um, and I think uh, it part I, I wrote the question before the talk so it partially maybe answered it but I'm still I think it would maybe be interesting to hear what you have to say uh, so uh, in video games and the spirit of capitalism, Um, you introduced uh, the striking notion that computer games are the aesthetic form of rationalization. And many of your games are based around pushing rationalized resource management to its uh, morally deviant conclusion. And, and in democratic socialism simulator, I believe you do something different, but you use uh, like similar tools. Um, do you see a way of making games that uh, don't only deconstruct and criticize rationalization, but also suggest a different mode of thinking and doing things? And uh, what should we want from video games? And last, like, uh, is there a, a right ratio between uh, our investment in criticism and our investment in uh, articulating our dreams of a more just uh, society? Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Yeah, there, there might be even like two, two or three questions in there. But yeah, I think, uh, yeah, b- by the way, uh, I should probably like, share this. Uh, by the way, like one thing that I, that I do, I don't know, uh, that you can check uh, on the website. If you scroll down, there's like theory that is mostly like talks really that I uh, tend to, um, tend to uh, you know, transcript and publish in the way they are. So you can read them as uh, essentially an article. They are like very informal and not academic at all because I can't do that. And uh, one was this one that is being a reference to video games and the spirit of capitalism. That is kind of all like 2014. Uh, but I think it's still, I'm, I'm still, you know, thinking about that, those things. Uh, yeah, I propose to that, to that sort of like inherent problem of, um, Uh, of games uh, being uh, having a kind of uh, affinity for quantity optimization uh, uh, rationalization uh, I think the two main strategies for that is are to temper that rationalization with uh, storytelling uh, to make an example that it's not mine uh, papers please which is a game that I, I'm not like super you Uh, enamored with that but I think it's a good representation of that in papers please that you probably all know uh, you have like an element that is like the mere bureaucratic execution of an action right so it's kind of like using that taking advantage of that sort of like recognizing people like uh, you know going through processes and uh, being like very efficient in that um, but at the same time there is like a story that is happening and In the background or through this, uh, this this sort of situation and the story is really what makes uh, the thing work to me uh, or same similar thing an older game uh, cart life uh, also has that you might have like a game loop that is uh, uh, about uh, efficiency and repetition and functional thinking but then like uh, there is uh, uh, almost like a dialectical relationship with other things that you're interested in doing having you know maintaining relationships so uh, Uh, fixing your marriage or something like that uh, so that is one way the other way might be to uh, have like more like intentionally broken uh, sort of like system so like uh, I'm maybe enticing you with the 
uh, the sort of like uh, idea of control and the idea of like sort of like cybernetic idea of like uh, I'm satisfying the sense of uh, setting up systems that work, uh, but then I'm also sort of like in, uh, hijacking that or like uh, sort of like putting a wrench into that machine uh, as as a as a way to sort of like criticize it or to problematize it. Yeah. The other question is like the balance between uh, uh, that sort of like uh, functions and uh, uh, devising an alternative uh, that is uh, still in progress, I guess. I don't know if there is like a good ratio, a good balance to that. But one thing that basically the thing that I'm uh, working on right now is to not only um, not only a game that is like utopian, uh, but a game that is like short term utopian which uh, um, is kind of like a narrative we don't really have. We have like uh, plenty of dystopian games, so pl plenty of dystopian narratives that are sort of like showing you, oh, if we keep doing this, the planet will go to shit, right? And uh, there are like so many, and video games sort of have, uh, especially AAA video games have their own twist, which is, uh, oh, if we keep uh, doing what we are doing, uh, the world will be, uh, wasteland isn't it cool because that's what video games usually do right uh isn't it cool that you get to you know shoot up people without you know feeling bad because everybody is bad uh so one way is to like uh, like one one of my next goals will be to inject some of them like utopian thinking and showing uh, you know oh, maybe like how can you do you know that how, how can a world be better or look better uh, and uh, the other uh, the other part of it is like how can you do so without being uh, you know uh, old old style utopian of like sort of like imagining the world uh, you know created from scratch which is it's kind of like the um, almost etymologically what utopia is it's kind of like a place that doesn't exist that is almost uh, in, that is kind of like functioning uh, pretty much perfectly. And uh, it's somewhere like way ahead in the future or in another planet uh, to the point that it's not even particularly useful as an envisioning mechanism. So, yeah. Thank you. Great. Renat, do you want to ask yes. something? No, I, I, I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really fine with the, with the questions. I think uh, the, the presentation was uh, fantastic. We have seen so much and enjoyed being in Like Like. Uh, I would like to pop up again there. Uh, Paolo, thank you so much for coming and for being with us and showing your really amazing and inspireful uh, works. Uh, exactly to students which are dealing with social innovations and doing stuff, hopefully for the good, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, for doing stuff which are more meaningful for a very narrow kind of industry that uh, Israel is kind of uh, situated right now. So on behalf of everybody, it was uh, really a pleasure, I think, uh, to have you here and thank right. you so much for your time, really. Thank you. And yeah, Thank check out so my much. stuff. Follow me on Twitter. Thank you, Paolo. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.